Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, a lot of fuss has been made about the size of the Titanic. And for sure, during its time, the ship was an absolute monster, displacing 52,000 tons and boasting an 892 foot or 269 meter length. When you have something that big at speed in the water though, it becomes very difficult to control and make it go where you want it to. Steering a ship accurately is hugely important to avoid collisions and make sure you're exactly where you need to be along your journey. So just how do you turn a 50,000 ton giant in an era before advanced electronics and computer systems? What role did the steering play on the night of the collision? Today, let's take a closer look and learn how they steered the Titanic. It was a pitch black moonless night and the Titanic was steaming along at 21 knots when a bell in the lookout's position rang. An iceberg had been spotted ahead. The officer of the watch bellowed out an order at the man behind the ship's wheel, hard to starboard, and painfully slowly, the ship's nose began to point away from the iceberg to the left. But hang on, the officer ordered hard to starboard, which is an order to turn the ship to the right. Why would he do that? Well, it's worth remembering that Titanic existed in a strange time at a crossroads where centuries of Royal Navy tradition met with huge technological leaps that happened in a very short space of time. For instance, just 60 years before the Titanic was launched, the world's largest ship looked like this. Now we'll come back to this conundrum in a minute, but first we need to understand how Titanic steering was designed and built. Titanic steering system was made up of some key components. First, the rudder at the very stern or the back of the ship, connected to and powered by the steering engines directly above it. Then, three steering positions connected to the steering engines could direct the ship and make changes to its course using the rudder. Here's how it all worked. We'll start with the rudder. Most ships are turned using a rudder and have been for centuries. The rudder is essentially a broad, flat surface fastened to the exterior and swung left or right to turn the ship. There are a lot of different kinds of rudder which grant different benefits, and for the longest time, sailing ships had used simple pintle and gudgeon rudders which swung along their front edge. In 1843, the famous engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel introduced the balanced rudder, which swung from an axis behind its front edge. Titanic's Cunard Line competitors, the Lusitania and Mauritania, used balanced rudders, but Titanic's rudder was different. It was a simpler, pintle and gudgeon, unbalanced rudder. The thing was enormous. It stood 78 feet, or 24 meters tall, about the height of a seven-story apartment building, and by itself, it weighed 101 and a quarter tons. The immense weight was thanks to its heavy construction. In modern ships, the rudder is usually hollow, but Titanic's huge rudder was made up of five massive, solid, mild steel casted sections coupled together by strong bolt flanges with forged bolts two to three and a half inches, or almost nine centimeters in diameter, holding them all together. The bolts were then buried in Portland cement, which was sculpted to hydrodynamically flow into the rudder sections and reducing corrosion by seawater, thanks to the turbulence along those big bolt heads, and reducing the overall drag. At the top of that rudder was a huge stock made up of forged steel and turned on a truly epic metal lathe in the machine shop. This was attached to the topmost rudder section with the same flange and bolt arrangement and the usual cement applied. Securing this enormous assembly to the ship was no easy task, and seven nickel steel pintles and corresponding gudgeons held its huge 101 ton weight and gave it the required axis for turning. Cast into the gudgeons attached to the ship's hull were two rudder stoppers which would prevent the rudder from swinging wildly out of control on either side. This limited the turning angle of Titanic's rudder to 40 degrees. Any further swing could create massive and sudden drag, damaging the ship's turning machinery and possibly shearing the rudder off entirely. Remarkably, the entire rudder assembly could be lifted up and removed from the ship for repair using pulleys and cables thanks to a series of pad eyes which were cast outside on the ship's stern. These pad eyes were strategically placed in line with the rudder as well as the ship's propellers so that repairs or replacements could be made in dry dock. Lusitania and Mauritania's balanced rudders were cutting edge, more in line with what would be found on warships of the day. Thanks to the balanced rudder's hydrodynamics, it meant that steering could be performed with less effort. 
Lusitania and Mauritania, thanks to their stern shape and the number of their propellers, could use a balanced rudder, but Titanic's design meant that a huge, heavy, unbalanced rudder would be needed instead, and it required an enormous amount of effort to swing it over. And this is where the second steering system came into play, the steering engine. Viewed from outside, Titanic's rudder stock disappeared into a hole at the base of the counter stern and the stern post. It ran a deck or two up until it reappeared inside a special room at the very back of the ship on the sea deck. This was the most rearward located compartment on the ship, behind the third class smoking and general rooms, and on the outside in photographs you can see it here. In the old days, ship's rudders were turned by a series of rope pulleys connected to the ship's wheels, but no rope could hope to turn a 7 story, 101 ton steel rudder like that on Titanic, so some pretty serious machinery would be needed, and there was no other option but the steam engine. Steam engines can create enormous amounts of torque, or rotational force, and in Titanic's case one would be needed to turn the ship's giant rudder. The engine had its work cut out for it, because not only did the rudder weigh over 100 tons, but as the angle of turn grew larger, so too would the pressure of water flowing over the rudder increase. Titanic's steering engine and gear was actually designed and made by the ship's builders, Harland and Wolfe, and featured two steam engines, with one serving as a backup. The three-cylinder steam engine would respond to commands from the ship's steering wheels, or helms, and its three pistons would turn a crankshaft clockwise or counterclockwise as necessary. This would in turn drive large toothed gears connected by their teeth to a massive steering quadrant, so-called because it resembled a quarter of a circle. The quadrant would then turn left or right, but it couldn't be connected to the rudder directly because this could put enormous strain on the engines and gear teeth and result in their damage or destruction. Instead, tiller arms, which were essentially big levers, were connected to the quadrant by heavy-duty spring coils so that they could absorb shocks or bumps in their operation and reduce overall stress on the steering gear. The tillers connected directly to the top of the rudder stock so that the steering engines turning the quadrant left or right would then mechanically turn the rudder in the required direction. If in the worst case scenario the whole thing stopped working, those tiller arms could be operated manually by connecting heavy ropes to nearby steam capstans which were usually only used for tying the ship up in port. So the gargantuan rudder was steered by mechanical means, by steam engines and heavy duty gears, but just how could a single man control this machinery by using a ship's wheel? Now this brings us to the final aspect of Titanic's steering system, the ship's wheels. And the ship actually had three steering positions. Two of them were forward, far away from the steering engines in the bridge. The first wheel was located in the navigating bridge, flanked by telegraphs which could ring down orders to the engine rooms, and behind this was the main ship's wheel kept safely inside a special, dedicated room known as the wheelhouse. The third and final steering location was way aft at the back of the ship, on top of a structure called the docking bridge, directly above the steering engine room. And here is how the ship's wheels worked. It may seem unusual to have two ship's wheels in the bridge, especially when you consider that the main ship's wheel was in a room with very limited visibility forward. The fact is though that for the majority of the ship's time at sea, very few steering orders are required to stay on course, so the main wheel doesn't need to be in a position where visibility is important. To this end, protecting the wheel from the elements and potential damage from monstrous waves and storms isn't such a bad idea, and the sailor operating the wheel, known as the helmsman, would be responding to orders from officers on the bridge who could actually see what was ahead. The wheel outside the wheelhouse was far more useful when frequent steering changes were necessary. This included coming into port or manoeuvring in dangerous or shallow waters. Typically, before Titanic entered a port, a small boat would come out to meet it, carrying a harbour pilot, a specialist with expert knowledge of the area, who could guide the ship in safely using that wheel and its excellent visibility. So just how do you connect these ship's wheels to a steam engine located hundreds and hundreds of feet away at the stern of the ship? Ropes and cables just couldn't handle it. So instead, a technologically advanced machine called a telemotor was employed to respond to inputs on the ship's wheel and send those back to the steering engines, turning the rudder. The telemotor was a very clever device. It was located in the wheelhouse directly in front of the main ship's wheel and comprised a few basic elements. It was essentially an early type of servo motor and it employed a cylinder in the wheelhouse and then a corresponding matching cylinder all the way back at the steering engine. Connecting these were hydraulic pipes containing a fluid mixture of 70% water and 30% glycerin to prevent freezing. 
Turning the ship's wheel left or right would push the wheelhouse's telemotor cylinder, forcing liquid through the pressurised pipes and pushing the corresponding cylinder at the other end of the ship, connected to the steering engine. Springs inside the telemotor cylinder would give feedback to the helmsman, meaning that as the turn became tighter and he turned the wheel more in one direction, it would require more force to turn the ship's wheel. If the helmsman released his grip on the ship's wheel, then the springs would return it to a neutral position and the cylinders would return the rudder to a midships. All of this would engage the ship's steering engine, turning the quadrant and the tiller, and therefore the ship's rudder. Because of this system, one man could turn a 101 ton rudder with relative ease. The navigating bridge wheel was connected to the telemotor as well and control could be alternated between either wheel as required. The third and final ship's wheel at the very back on the docking bridge didn't use a telemotor connection because it was located directly on top of the steering gear room. Instead, it was connected directly and mechanically to the steering engines. This gives us a bit of a clue as to its function and purpose. Without the need for a telemotor, this wheel could serve as a backup in case the hydraulic lines were breached or the telemotor was damaged or destroyed. In fact, many ships had a backup steering system which was directly connected to the steering engines, especially warships where the bridge was likely to get shot away in combat. Because Titanic's third steering wheel was located on top of the docking bridge, where crew would stand to assist Titanic's departure or arrival from port, it was long assumed that this wheel might be used in the docking process, but more recent analysis suggests that the wheel purely functioned as a backup in case the telemotor and hydraulic systems were down. In photographs, the wheel is always either covered up under canvas or just not being used at all. Now this brings us back to the conundrum from the start of this video. Why, on the night of the disaster, did First Officer William Murdoch order hard to starboard or to the right, when in fact he wanted the ship to turn to port or to the left? Well, this kind of takes us back to the tiller. You see, for the longest time, ships were steered with tillers, long lever arms connected to the rudder directly. Levers work in a simple fashion. Pushing the lever to the left will cause the rudder to swing out to the right, turning the ship to starboard. British merchant tradition reflected this, so steering orders on British ships were given in the traditional way. An order to starboard the helm actually meant to turn the wheel left, and an order to port the helm meant turning to the right. When Murdoch called out hard a starboard, he was ordering the Titanic's helmsman, quartermaster Robert Hitchens, to turn the wheel to the left as far as it would go, or hard over. We know of course that as Hitchens turned the wheel left, it would have become stiffer or harder to turn as the telemotor springs did their thing until it stopped at the hard over position. The rudder would then be at its maximum 40 degree turning angle, prevented from any more turning by the rudder stops. Rumours and myths surrounding Titanic's rudder and steering survive to this day, chiefly among which that the Titanic's rudder was too small for the ship's size, but it's just not true at all. Titanic's rudder was comparatively large and wide, and the ship had quite good manoeuvrability. The ship's crew just didn't have enough time to turn their ship after sighting the iceberg. The Titanic's design and construction just can't be blamed for this one. Today, on the wreck, very little is left of Titanic's bridge, and the ship's wheels are all gone, but still standing in the remains of the wheelhouse is the lone telemotor, a reminder of the night's events and a monument to the ingenuity of Edwardian engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.